Dear all, good evening. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce today and make some remarks on the occasion of the presentation of the Themistocles Prize and Statesmanship to the distinguished professor, Robert Jervis. Let me first say uh, that today, in, in a way that's actually appropriate as we shall see, Athens is dealing with unprecedented rainfall. So let us hope that the power grid holds and there's no disruption in Wi-Fi. And if there is, we'll manage. But this is appropriate when it comes to an award in statesmanship, because in reality, in real life, nothing goes necessarily as planned. Every once in a while, you're throwing a curveball. Every once in a while, something happens that's unexpected, unpredictable. Think of the pandemic. So this in its own way is very appropriate. Let me also say that it is uh, very appropriate that our department, the Department of International and European Studies of the University of Pires is hosting this award today. Why do I say that? We are, and this is a, by objective criteria, the most selective international relations, political studies, or international studies department, not only at the university, but in Greece. We have a number of graduate degrees and we offer them in English, although we're uh, obviously based in Greece, including on energy and American studies, which is new. Uh, the energy is uh, the best in Greece. American studies is the first in Greece in 200 years. We have awarded honorary doctorates to the president of the state of Israel, the foreign minister of Russia, the president of the Federal Republic of uh, Germany, uh, Professor uh, Pierre Katzenstein and, uh, and others. Uh, and uh, in this sense, uh, again, this is very appropriate. We also hosted Professor Kenneth Walsh in one of his final, uh, if not his final, public uh, major talks and discussions, which is on YouTube. And I still remember him saying that there are very few places anywhere where you can get more than 300 students on a talk on IR theory, but we did it. So I think Professor Jervis, you will feel at home uh, here. Two other points that I want to make. One is about the actual award and its inception. And then another thing that may uh, surprise some people, but it shouldn't. So let me be very brief and uh, I'll try to be succinct. Easier said than done when it comes to my case, but I'll try. So first of all, this is an award of statesmanship awarded to a truly distinguished professor. Some might object. They might say, well, you know, statesmanship that has to do with action, politicians maybe, but why to an academic? And to me, the reply is obvious. Without knowledge, without ideas, without strategy, without a plan, without wisdom, action is meaningless. It's counterproductive, even destructive. So I think it's very, again, very appropriate. Finally, and before I pass the proverbial baton to Professor Platias, let me say how this award came into being. We were flying to uh, Israel, and as we were landing near, uh, we were approaching uh, Tel Aviv, and we had a wonderful view of the Mediterranean Sea. And at that point, a eureka moment for Professor Platias. He said, you know what? We should establish the Themistocles Award. But look, this is, uh, I, can, I can almost replicate his thought process. The, East, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean, Important two and a half thousand years ago, important today. Extremely important for Greece, extremely important for Israel. Con two countries are now getting together. Uh, Themistocles was perhaps the first grand strategist in the region and all the rest have followed in his footsteps. So again, I think this was, uh, and I'm revealing this, this was the moment of inception and I cannot think of a better person uh, to receive this award than Professor, than Professor Robert Jervis. Uh, with this, uh, Professor Platias, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aris. I'm really thrilled that uh, we have with us Professor Jervis. I think it's one of the three most important theories of international relations in the last 50 years. With Professor Kenneth Waltz and with Professor 
Robert Gilpin, I think they have made the most important contribution in the theory of international relations in the last half century. So uh, uh, I'm really thrilled. And also, I need to point out that this year is 2,500 years by the end of the Persian War. Oh, it's, it all ended with the land battle of Plataeus, uh, where the Greeks managed to defeat the remaining part of the Persians. But actually, the outcome of this battle was decided a year ago in the naval battle of Salamin. There, in this naval battle of Salamis, Themistocles managed essentially to defeat the naval component of the Persian invasion and uh, forced the Persian king to retreat, taking together not only the remaining of the fleet, the one that survived from Salamis, but also the bulk of his land forces. So the victory that we celebrate this year, exactly 25 centuries for the end of the Persian War, was related actually to Themistocles and his victory in, uh, in Salamis. Uh, le let me try to make the connection between Themistocles and Professor Gerdes. Themistocles' statesman uh, was a great leader. And Professor Gerdes has made an immense contribution in the study of leadership. Actually, one of his last book is How Leaders Think. Uh, and here, I, I must emphasize that the typical international relations theory has neglected the role of statesmanship. I mean, from Marxist to structural realist, they emphasize structure. But somehow leaders, the so-called first image of international relations, that neglected part can be significant. As you can see from the case of Themistocles, power is not something abstract. Somebody has created them. So statesmen, they don't only use power, they create power through reform. And Themistocles turned a, a, a second class agricultural mid-sized city into a naval empire. This means creating power. So leaders can create power. Leaders can shape outcomes, can make the difference between war and peace. Here we have a strategist, the Mistocles, that managed uh, to, uh, to beat the Goliath, the Persian Empire. It's a classical case, David against Goliath. And this is strategy. So not only he created power, he multiplied it. Uh, and shape the outcomes, but also shape the domestic structure of Athens by uh, utilizing the whole Athenian population, including the lower classes in the Navy. Essentially, uh, he created the preconditions for democracy, for the democracy that we celebrate in Athens is the, in Greece is the birthplace, it needed not only institutional reforms, but also substantive reforms that will give power to, to, to all citizens. So actually he saved the DNA of his city. Uh, and also in the national relations theory talks about how power shapes international outcomes. But you, know, but you see, if you create powers, if you uh, power, if you defeat an empire, like the Persian Empire, and you create your own empire. In fact, you save international power. So leadership can also save international outcomes. So I think international relations and structural realism, and realism in particular, has really neglected leadership. And uh, th thanks God, Professor Jeremy has not neglected it and has brought it in the forefront. And I think it's, uh, it's appropriate, the connection between Themistocles and the work of Professor Jervis. The second element is strategy. Uh, Themistocles used strategy to, for David to, de to defeat Goliath, you need to, to use strategy. And he took several important decisions. I mean, 
he created a fleet. Uh, he persuaded the Athenians that, that was essentially farmers to, to build a fleet, then to money, and then to use the fleet uh, and actually to leave their city and go to the fleet and fight in order to regain his city. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, and then building an empire. So he has made immense contribution in strategy, but also Professor Jervis has written some of the best books on strategy. From the logic of nuclear strategy to how perception shapes strategy has made immense contribution in strategy. Uh, last but not least, uh, Themistocles is really the first geopolitician. He used one element, the sea, to create outcomes, not only in war and peace, but shape outcomes in the land. Uh, what actually Pericles, his successor said, and Thucydides recorded, if you control the sea, you control the world. That has been the mantra of geopolitics, at least one part of geopolitics, the, uh, the ones that give emphasis to the importance of the sea. So for all these reasons, Thucydides characterized Themistocles as the most important leader of the fifth century, actually even more important than Pericles. Uh, for all these reasons, uh, we think that the Themistocles award uh, is the most distinctive award that our department can give, and, that, and we have named this award as the Themistocles Award. And we are really grateful to present this award to Professor Jervis for his uh, uh, immense contribution. But I would like now ask my colleague, Yanis Kostadopoulos, to be a little more specific to the contribution of Professor Jervis. I, I, I laid a broad uh, outline of his uh, work and I connected with the Mistocles, but uh, Professor Kostadopoulos can go in a little more detail in his contribution in international relations, in strategy and in leadership. John. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Platias. Dear Professor Jervis, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, dear students, it is a great pleasure and honor to welcome you in this event and present you the contribution of the honored Professor Robert Jervis. It is also a distinctive landmark for the Department of International and European Studies, which anonymously decided to award him the Themistocles Award. Robert Jervis is Adlai Stevenson Professor and Professor of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University at the School of International and Public Affairs. He is internationally recognized for his innovative and prominent contribution to international relations and especially their linkage with psychology, not only in his academic publications, but also in his teaching. Professor Jervis obtained his BA from Oberlin College 1962 and his MA as well as his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley in 1963 and 1968 respectively. Professor Jervis has taught at Harvard University, at the University of California, Los Angeles, at the Hebrew University, and at Yale University, while he was International Affairs Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Since a full presentation of his activities in academia and policy will take hours, I will focus on only some of them. Professor Jervis is a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and of the American Academy of Political and Social Science, a member of the American Philosophical Society, a member of the British Academy, and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations while he was president of the American Political Science Association in 2000, uh, until 2001. Moreover, he is co-editor of one of the most important book series, The Cornell Studies and Security Affairs, founding editor of the International Security Studies Forum, and member of 10 editorial boards of prominent academic journals, among them, the famous International Security, General of Strategic Studies, Intelligence and National Security, and many others, as well as head of the CIA Historical Review Panel from 1998 to 2018. He has received several awards and distinctions, like uh, Gray Mayer Award for the book with the best ideas for improving world order, for his book, The Meaning of the Nuclear Revolution, 
Career Achievement Award Security Studies Section of International Studies Association 1996, the Laswell Award for Lifetime Achievement from the International Society of Psych Political Psychology in 2004, the National Academy of Science Award for Contributions on Behavioral Science to Preventing Nuclear War in 2006, and the inaugural Distinguished Scholar Award from the Foreign Policy Section of the American Political Science Association in 2016. Professor Jervis specializes in international politics and security policy in the field of decision making and intelligence studies, as well as in theories of conflict and cooperation. He has published or co edited several books, uh, in addition to, what, uh, to the books Professor Platias mentioned. I have to mention System Effects. Uh, He co-edited with Robert Art, uh, International Politics, Enduring Concepts and Contemporary Issues, a classic in strategy. He has written an intelligence book, Why Intelligence Fails, Lessons from the Iranian Revolution and the Iraq War. And he co-authored with Richard Netlebo and Johnny Stein, Psychology and Deterrence. Furthermore, he has published more than 100 articles in prominent academic journals like International Security, International Organization, International Studies Quarterly, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, World Politics, Political Science Quarterly, and many more. Robert Jervis' contribution in international relations generally and in strategy, psychology, and intelligence studies particularly is decisive and priceless. He is a pioneer in the study of the contribution of psychology in, the interna in international relations. His classic book about perceptions and misperceptions in international politics gave us a new way of studying the influence of the individual on state action, contrary to the rational actor model. His last version of this book includes a new 85 page preface, which gives us a new historical example from the end of the Cold War, from intelligence failures before the Iraq invasion and from Obama administration, but does not fundamentally change his main arguments. His book, The Logic of Images in International Relations, which was based on his dissertation about the role of images in international relations, enlightened our knowledge about how states promote their interests by projecting images, accurate or deceptive, and the relation between signalers and perceivers. As far as nuclear strategy is concerned, he coined the term nuclear revolution, stating that war is unthinkable after the advent of nuclear weapons and that mutual vulnerability created by nuclear weapons has brought about a fundamental shift in the nature of warfare and even of statecraft itself. His expertise in political psychology contributed to his approach to nuclear strategy and helped him realize that nuclear weapons are fundamentally different than other military technologies and that any explanation is incomplete without understanding ideas and beliefs about the bomb. This is true for deterrence also. However, contrary to his previous belief that the mutual second strike capability is secure and might always work, he now concludes that, quote, technological innovations have now greatly increased the vulnerability of strategic systems, end of quote. In his book, uh, System Effects, he conducts criticism to Kenneth Waltz for the influence of systems, and he questions the foundations of many social sciences, including political science, by using complexity theory. More recently, in his books about intelligence failures and the way that leaders think, Professor Jervis offers us his holistic perspective in international relations, and he sheds light on how various psychological needs construct our beliefs and perceptions, as well as how irrational is in reality our, our way of thinking. In concluding, Professor Robert Jervis is not only one of the most important mainstream political scientists of, scientists of our era and an expert in international politics, but also an honorary diplomatic historian, since according to Professor Steinberg, quote, by mirroring the emerging insight from psychology with a deep knowledge of the history and practice of international relations, he has over four decades created a valuable perspective that made it possible to build a synthesis between the world of parsimonious theory and the complexity of historical inquiry. He was influenced by Glenn Snyder, Thomas Selling, Arnold Wolfers, Irving Goffman, and Kenneth Waltz, 
and he later influenced his and the next generation of IR theorists and strategists. I hope that this brief presentation managed to illustrate the importance of Professor Zervi's multidimensional, innovative, and interdisciplinary work, both for the community of international relations and of psychology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. He has influenced us and our students. He is well quoted and our students read his book. So it's really a great honor, Professor Jervis. To present you this award made by a famous uh, sculpt, Pavlos, a famous artist in Greece. Uh, we hope with Professor Chabiris, we will be in New York in the Columbia Faculty Club in the near future when travel is permitted to present it to you in person. And also something very rare. Uh, the Bank of Greece last year made a commemorative coin uh, to commemorate the 25 centuries for the battle, naval battle of Salamis. And in this rare coin, there is the face of Themistocles and the opposite, it's the naval ships that managed to win the battle and crea create the empire. Uh, and uh, hopefully this rare coin will be a memory of, uh, for, you, for you and your family of, to, of today's event. So we are deeply honored, Professor Jervis, and we would love to hear your thoughts about uh, leadership. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, all of you, for the award and the, the kind words. I'm <clears throat> glad to, to be here. If it virtually you regret to, that uh, COVID beat beat us by one one or two weeks over a year ago, and I would really have loved to come back to Athens. I was in Athens over oh over forty years ago and enjoyed it, and was very much looking forward to to the trip. Um, I'd also. Uh, very glad that John mentioned some of the people that really influenced me. And I would just say, especially for the students that uh, academic research is often quite, we think it was quite solitary. Um, my own work, I only occasionally co-author. So we think it's one person at the desk or the computer, but it really, of course, is not. It's highly collective, even when there's one author. And our footnotes, which I think to non-academics look pedantic and fussy and, um, and unnecessary, not only help you know, people look for other things to read, but I think they mark the fact that none of us are doing this alone. And people like, uh, if in my own case, absolutely right, Arnold Wolfers, who I never met, but I consider the best of the sort of American realists. I mean, they're not American, all came from Europe, but that group, I, I considered Wolfers the one who I learned most from and my professors, Glenn Snyder and Ken Waltz and Tom Schelling, uh, and also I'd add Alex George, you know, are people without whom I couldn't have done any of this. Also, just to mention of Ken Waltz, I just want to say that um, Ken, as some of you know, uh, has a, a Greek uh, daughter-in-law who we absolutely adored and talked about her all the time, more than he talked about uh, the son <laughs> whom she was married. 
Having met her, I, I understand Ken's affection. And I say, I think on one of his last trip, maybe his last trip abroad to Greece, uh, and she accompanied him. And when he uh, came back, he just raved about her and your hospitality and uh, you know, what a enjoyable and, and marvelous time it was. With that, I'll talk for about 25 minutes on leadership in a recalcitrant area, er, era under uh, five headings, five, I think it is. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the first a general introduction, uh, then the conditions that make leadership easier. And then third, related why it's particularly hard now. And then breaking that down into domestic and international, and then a bit on the future, which is of course unknowable, partly because uh, leadership can change it. Uh, first general point is leadership is never easy. And there's an intricate relations between leaders and followers. First, leadership implies followership. You can't lead unless you can get others to follow, not necessarily passively, but follow in some sense. They must fully participate. And of course, if Ms. Cleves, as uh, Plato said, it really is amazing that in order to defeat, lead a coalition to defeat the Persians, he had to persuade the Athenians to in effect change the social structure by empowering the lower class. He then had and persuade them to become a naval power entirely contrary to their traditions and to leave the city and let the city be burned down as the only way to save it. That is truly stunning, but only uh, takes nothing away from his skill to say that it also required the cooperation, the persuadability, if you will, of the Athenians. And so there's always these intricate relations between followers and leaders. There's probably the apocryphal story in the French Revolution of uh, someone frantically running up to a, a bystander and asking where the crowd is going and he said, I must know because I'm its leader. And uh, leaders are in some ways in debt, require followers, are indebted to them. Even, and we see in even uh, Donald Trump, not my favorite leader, but uh, that he often says, I can't do this because my base or my followers will not tolerate it. And the um, real test perhaps of the leaders is how they can not escape from this, there is a, but ameliorate it, uh, avoid it, guide it, not be trapped by their followers and yet keep that connection to them. This I think always requires a very intricate combination of honesty and guile. Again, Mr. Cleese epitomizes this. Uh, when I say guile, um, I mean to include deception. And of course, the battle of, of Salamis was won through deception. It's, you know, sending a false defector to the Persians to say that half the fleet had left and that it was vulnerable. Uh, that was, couldn't have won the battle without that. And in many other cases, he employs deception. And I've written about deception starting in my book, The Logic of Images, and it's, it's very important 
in international politics and uh, uh, still understudied. But anyway, when I say guile, I, I mean more than that because I think what we see in him and in other leaders is also a, an ability to empathize with others, to understand them, sometimes to understand them more than they understand themselves because leaders know that uh, in order to get others to follow them, to get others to do what they want, they need a form of persuasion, not without power. Power is always an element, but uh, leadership can't be fully coerced. And I think we see this rather even in, in dictatorships, but certainly in more participatory uh, states. Leaders have to really understand their followers on a deep level, which is not, not easy. Um, and it requires a psychological balance in the leaders to know when to use deception and how to use it without deceiving him, him or herself and without the, uh, creating the image that, oh, well, this person is always deceptive, or usually. Uh, so the, this requires often a great honesty. Themistocles had to tell the Athenians that following his strategy would result in their city being burned down. And it was, I think, his willingness to be honest with his own people at that crucial point that permitted, it didn't, uh, didn't do everything, but at least was necessary for that. And I think um, that's very hard. It's always tempting to take the easier way and to tell people there are sacrifices. Um, so you know, there's a, this real mixture of honesty and, and guile. Also, I say there's a tension, not fully explored, between leadership and democracy. I'll come back to that. That is, democracy stresses leaders embodying and following, if you will, the values, the preferences, the beliefs of the bulk of the population. Well, you know, that's very much, if you will, a bottom up, whereas we think of leadership as much more top down. The two are not entirely incompat incompatible. I think there is a tension there, which I want to return to. Um, also, and this came up as on the introductory remarks that um, leaders can never plan everything out in advance. Uh, president Eisenhower, who was of course a general before he was president, said from his military experience that plans are useless, but planning is everything. And odd, and what he meant, and I think it's quite right, is that, um, you know, that's the classic statement, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. There are so many things that will be different. But the exercise of not only the individual, but the group, the organization, and the society of thinking through and doing the planning is what allows them to then adapt. And uh, because the world will always provide pandemics, heavy rainfall, all sorts of things that are unforeseen and unforeseeable that have to be coped. Right, let me talk briefly. The conditions that make leadership easier uh, as a prelude to why it's hard now. Uh, dire situations like wartime, you know, people are much more willing to accept leadership, to 
say, well, the leader has information that I can never have, and I looks odd to me, but we will do it. Now, uh, we shouldn't idealize this. First, it can be dangerous, as we know, leaders can then mislead. Uh, and even in, I think, the best examples, I think of Winston Churchill and FDR in World War II, that leadership was very difficult. I think um, in some of our books, it seems easy. Oh yes, you know, Churchill and, and Roosevelt could map things out. They didn't have to worry about domestic support. Not true at all. They both had hard rides domestically. Uh, Churchill was always worried about losing the confidence of parliament and of the country. Roosevelt uh, paid very careful attention to public opinion and to what his margin was, where he could move and where he couldn't. This was uh, a major part for both of them of how they had to conduct the war, conduct themselves. Nevertheless, it still makes it easier, if not easy. A second factor uh, used again in World War II uh, is fewer uncontrolled channels of communication. Again, Roosevelt and uh, Churchill, and of course, the, uh, Stalin and Hitler, very different situations, could almost not quite monopolize, but really dominate communication channels. And they set up elaborate instruments of information, if you call it, if you approve, propaganda, if you're more critical, but to shape public opinion. And a third factor, a presence of a degree of deference and trust, a general sense that the institutions work, that one should listen to, defer to leaders, at least in foreign policy. Third general category now, things are much harder, as I say, leadership in a recalcitrant world. The three situations we're talking conditions I mentioned don't hold. Many people do believe it's a dire situation, but their diagnosis is very different. I think of American domestic politics where there are a large number of people who say democracy is in danger. Many of uh, Democrats and Republicans agree on that, but what they, but they disagree about what that means. So they're, is, you know, that is not something conducive to leadership. We know, of course, been enormous written about the end of broadcasting and the rise of narrow casting. Instead, in the US of three networks that everyone watched, you have this incredible proliferation of communication channels, now so, uh, social media, and the people can choose and basically many, if not most people, choose a homogeneous diet of information that is uh, supports and reinforces their views and is very resistant to a more general leadership. Third, uh, we're in an era of low trust and low deference. In the US, uh, partly this is a product of Vietnam and the Watergate scandal. It's more than that because uh, trust has gone down in most at least West European countries as well. Um, and it's hard to know all the reasons, but it makes leadership hard. But I do want to stress what I mentioned on the 
tension between leadership and democracy. This is not all bad. There can be certainly too much deference, too much trust. Um, that say one reason for the decline in the US, Vietnam and Watergate, well, you can say that in the 50s and early 60s, the American public was too trusting. And Congress, again, again, this come from the US, but Congress deferred too much to the executive branch. So the, <clears throat> the greater, if you will, democratization is a poses major problems for leadership. <clears throat> well, this is true both domestically and internationally. Let me start domestically and then internationally. And again, when I say domestically, my knowledge obviously is the centers on the US. I think it is broader, but you know, that first the increased polarization that is so prominent. Uh, foreign policy is now much more partisan than it was. Again, we shouldn't exaggerate uh, that the phrase foreign policy stops at the water's edge, very popular in the US in the first decade of the Cold War was never true. There was always extreme partisan disagreement over foreign policy. But now <clears throat> people in the parties uh, are much more polarized. My colleague, Bob Shapiro and his collaborators have shown the, the gap between pu and public opinion between Democrats and Republicans on foreign policy issue is much greater. We know this, of course, domestically. And we know that furthermore, it isn't only a difference in opinion, it's an intensity and a belief that the other's side, not other countries, others in your country are not a, a political opponents, but if you are enemies and, and evil, if you look at the level of affect, negative emotion to the extent we can measure it through standard instruments of public opinion like feeling thermometer, it's enormous. That is what Democrats think of Republicans and vice versa. You know, that in that degree uh, makes it very hard for anyone to do what President Biden I think is trying to do. We can you know, sort of bring people together when people don't want to be brought together, you know, they really are dug in. Second, as I mentioned, just to remind you, I think, you know, a general cynicism and lack of trust. I think we see in many of our institutions that uh, a few, in the American case, uh, get high levels of trust. The military, interestingly, enough, despite its failures in all the wars, the military is trusted. The courts, not as much, as <clears throat> most other things, journalism, even universities, the police. You know, there's a general level of distrust, which makes leadership at all levels hard. I think also there's a growth of uh, DIY, do it yourself, a sense of there's a lot that individuals and groups can do. And you should ignore not orders, but even suggestions from the top. And this is good and bad, a bad in that it can be very fragmented. Uh, it can mean on things like COVID vaccination, people are more than willing to substitute what they glean from the internet for their friends for solid 
scientific information. Not that the science is unambiguous on many things, although I think on the vaccines is pretty unambiguous. Um, so, you know, it's easy to focus on how this is bad, and I think it is, but again, it is a degree of democratization of people in groups saying, uh, we're taking, if you will, taking ownership that we will chart our own paths. Internationally, it's very hard. Although again, don't, we shouldn't be nostalgic. Uh, we can look now at NATO and say, NATO is in disarray. Well, I'm old enough to know that NATO has always been in crisis. When I was in high school and college, grad school, you go to the bookstore and you look at the books on international affairs, NATO in crisis. It was a book, you know, this much of the bookshelf was always, now NATO really is in crisis every year. So, you know, wasn't easy. It is harder now. There is perhaps a Russian threat, but it is not at the order of magnitude of the Soviet threat and allows for a good deal more of differences to how great it is. Um, it's also leadership much harder because Trump taught the American allies uh, IR 101. That is most of us who teach our courses do, even if we're constructivists, talk some about anarchy and the fact that nations cannot, not only they can't bind others, they can't bind themselves to how they'll behave in the future, and which has enormous consequences. I think we, that is academics, a lot of policy making public got complacent in the pre-Trump era. The American commitments to allies were considered immutable, they'd lasted through detente, tension, the end of the Cold War, all you know, leaders coming and going, all sorts of tensions. And then Trump comes and comes very close to pulling out of NATO and certainly uh, led everyone, I think, to question the American commitment, whether good or bad, different issue. My point is, that having, you can't unring that bell. Biden can say all he wants about American commitment to allies, hey, leaving aside the deal with Britain and Australia, which France, although not many of the other Europeans regard as a betrayal, but uh, Biden can say all he wants about his commitment to NATO, he can even do much more, he can consult, and everyone knows that Trump could win in 2024, or a Trumpist, or anyone, 2024, 28, 32, could come in and undo a lot. We knew this always theoretically, but I think, you know, people were lulled into a sense. And now they're, alas, learned that lesson. Another problem, again, the American being America centric, is the US is less willing to provide public goods to keep an alliance or do leadership. Leadership requires sacrifice, um, doing things to help others, and in the long run will help your country, but it's a long run. And you know the public goods. And glad to hear the mention of Robert Gilpin, who was a marvelous scholar and a good friend of mine, and a marvelous person. Uh, Gilpin stressed that and stressed the decline in the cycles of countries, the decline in the willingness of the country to provide 
of public goods. Now, of course, leadership can come not only from a country, but more collectively, some in Europe, especially uh, President Macron, talk about Europe taking, if not world leadership, at least respond, you know, becoming its own major power. Uh, no, I wish it would happen. It won't happen. Um, I won't go completely on my anti-French kick. Uh, you know, the, the French belief in their grandeur and the importance of it is inimical to real leadership because it doesn't leave room for others. And when the French talk about the central role for Europe, there's a footnote, which is France is leading the rest of Europe. We listen a little, but you people come along. No, that isn't, the French can't do it without renouncing a lot of what is French and they can't. Germans can't do it enough said, you know, the differences run deep. I would love to see a more united Europe, even counterbalancing the US. I think the obstacles are just insurmountable. Uh, finally, I say leadership is hard uh, internationally when coalitions, and I think again the, on the American side, involve both interest and ideology that we you know, say we you know, pro-democratic values, but also the straight interest. We could put that together in the Cold War because in the end, the US was willing for better or worse to tolerate and work with uh, dictatorships. I don't have to explain that to an, a Greek audience. Now it's harder because the interests are more muted. And I think although the misadventure in Iraq has made America less willing to if will fight for democracy, uh, harder to hold together coalitions when some of its members are not fully democratic. Finally, because I'm running over time, I'm very brief about the future. Or that can be brief because uh, of the saying, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. That statement often attributed to Yogi Berra, the Yankee catcher, is actually Niels Bohr, the famous uh, yeah, Dutch uh, uh, quantum theorist. Anyway, um, the fact, and I think it's a fact that leaders matter, says that history is somewhat contingent, that it's not determined. That uh, means it's very hard, indeed in principle impossible to make really clear predictions. I just would want to close with two things on this and leader that really reiterate what I said at the start, that leadership requires a willingness to sacrifice short run self-interest and for leaders to run political risks. And Morgenthau, not my favorite early IR theorist, I think Wolf was, was much more perceptive, but Morgenthau prescriptively said that a realist leader had to be uh, as European leaders had said for centuries, ruthless, ruthless for their countries, but selfless for themselves. That is, in the end, they had to be willing to sacrifice their own careers for the good of their country. That's a very hard combination to expect in people. You get it occasionally. And finally, uh, again, return to the Mysticles and what I meaning the combination of honesty and guile of, as I like, to, I'm very proud to be in the Adlai Stevenson Professor of International Politics. So when I was 
12 and 16, I stood on street corners passing out leaflets for Adlai Stevenson and uh, still have great admiration uh, for him. And one of the things he said about his campaign is he was gonna talk sense to the American people. We can debate whether he did all, but there was, I think, an element of honesty that's crucial for leadership. But it can't be unmixed that guile, both deception, indirection, cloaking what one is doing, if not being outright lying, is also necessary. These ingredients are very hard for individuals, very hard for societies. It's a real challenge for the future. That I've gone over. Let me stop and for questions and comments. And thank you. Thank you, Professor Chervis. That was really a historic speech. I mean, you took the concept of leadership from fifth century before Christ, you moved it today and you make predictions to the future. Uh, I, I think it, uh, I learned a lot and we are really grateful. And in your last remark about the, uh, that leaders sometimes need to sacrifice themselves for the common good is absolutely the case of Themistocles. I mean, he had to take certain actions that undermine his political status in Greece and he created a lot of enemies, both domestically and most importantly Sparta, because he could see that the next big competition was Sparta. So if he was building wall and adopting a anti-Spartan strategy that Pericles continues, but you know, oh, the, the Spartans conspired against him with his domestic enemies, and actually he paid uh, a huge price uh, uh, working for the good of, of, of his country. So your point brings us back to uh, the fifth century uh, before Christ. And I, I also, oh, you know, oh, I, I loved your comment on the French, by the way, uh, especially because the Greeks last, uh, last week made uh, an alliance that involved security guarantees from the part of the French. So uh, your comments, uh, although not planned, uh, were very relevant in, in our uh, po political uh, debate. But b before I open the floor to uh, questions to some of my colleagues, uh, I really want to ask you the following. I mean, if we could see you, uh, could see Professor Jervis as a tree, had many branches, work on intelligence, leadership, strategy, psychology. What's your favorite branch? I mean, to put it differently, what's your most favorite book? I mean, it's difficult to choose uh, among your, uh, your children, uh, your books are your children, but uh, do you have a favorite one? Do you think that there is an area uh, that uh, you like working more? A great question, yeah. Um, sometimes people, especially, but not only uh, graduate students, try to interview me and say, are you a realist or not? And, and you're right. I mean, I've worked in very different styles and uh, they somewhat contradict themselves. It doesn't bother me. But I do have a favorite book here, and it's the one that is uh, mentioned, but it's probably the least known, and that is System Effects, which looks at the dynamics of systems, the unintended consequences, non-linearities, uh, tipping points that occur in a connected uh, when you have large numbers of interconnections, that I think that uh, that book says more about not only international politics, but the subtitle is Complexity in Political and Social Life, that it applies much more broadly. And also it 
applies to and is strongly influenced by evolutionary biology. I close with a quote from the famous evolutionary theorist saying, nothing in biology uh, makes sense except in light of evolution and heavily on ecology. So um, it's the book I, when I, I don't urge grads to graduates to try to sort of do their dissertations based on it. The way it's too esoteric, it's um, too hard, but I do urge them to read it because I think what you, what I was able to see drawing up all these other disciplines is really central and still very much underappreciated. It does just not to go into, they'll bring up a problem again in leadership and acting and something I've given some talks on, hope to, well, probably won't be able to write up. It's that if you really believe a lot of the outlook of complexity, it does mean that unintended consequences are very common. They not always, and they may not dominate, but they're very common. And what any what leaders know, again, how hard it is to predict, you follow one policy, how will it actually be worked out? What will happen? It's, it's you know, it can be multiple effects many of which you don't want, and they can defeat your objectives. A leader, however, both politically and psychologically, needs confidence. And again, this brings back to the psychology. The leader has to be able to tell his or her government, the other, you know, cabinet members, the general public, if we do this, it's really going to work out in effect. And the leader has to believe it. I think him, him or herself. It's the psychological pressures on leaders are enormous. Again, Henry Kissinger has just a couple of sentences about that. That for leaders to recognize that they no matter how carefully they've analyzed the situation and the alternatives, what they're doing may turn out badly is extraordinarily difficult. It's not surprising that many of them end up with severe mental health problems. It's an incredible burden. So they have to, in a way, understand and appreciate forms of complexity but in the end, have to put a lot of that aside to, as they come to decide on a policy, throw themselves into it, convince others that it's the right thing and to be able to sleep at night. Well, Professor Tervis, you said uh, you love this book and you said it's unappreciated. We have a colleague in our department Professor Paravantes that thinks that that's the most important book in international relations that uh, has ever read. So it's not always uh, uh, unappreciated. And, and by the way, I think you, again in your comment, you highlighted Themistocles. Uh, let's imagine this leader trying to persuade his population to leave the city to be burned and actually play everything at sea in one battle. Let's assume that it went the other way. Essentially, that would have been the end of Athens. I mean, imagine the psychological pressure of the decision, uh, to, first of all, to, to make that decision to move from the city and also gobble everything um, in one battle. And most importantly, giving a message to the Persian king immediately makes you a traitor, Yes. right? If things have turned the other way, he could have been the 
simply yes. Trento. Oh, so uh, I can see why leaders uh, can have mental health when they have to put in their shoulders uh, their whole city and the whole nation uh, with their decision on war and peace and the uh, uh, outcomes on war and peace. Uh, let me ask my colleagues if they would like to ask any question on Aris, please. Uh, Professor Trivis, uh, while you were talking about leadership and democracy, I was reminded of two quotes and I'm gonna use them to maybe transition to my question on something slightly different. The one is the famous quote by uh, Winston S. Chur uh, Churchill, uh, democracy is the worst form of government, but for all the rest. And then there's another story, maybe apocryphal. Adlai Stevenson enters a hall, there's a big banner, Adlai Stevenson, the thinking man's candidate. Yes. And he says, that's all well and good, but I wanna win the election. So uh, for a long time, uh, leaders at the very highest levels have been pinpointing problematic aspects of democratic regimes and perhaps the aspects change, but, but it, there are problems. Uh, no one is denying them. But as we move towards the 21st century, I see both a rise of authoritarian regimes and perhaps a coming clash or competition, once again, between democracies and uh, uh, autocracies. And I was wondering if you might want, if you have some thoughts on this, and if you uh, might want to contrast leadership in those two different, broadly speaking, types of regimes. Thank you. Yes, yeah, a very important question. Um, we have, of course, seen the rise of authoritarianism in uh, Eastern Central Europe, thinking especially of, of Poland and Hungary. And of course, uh, in the US, and um, you know, like, mo or like most academics, I was and am horrified by Trump, but I realized that there are large segments of the population that disagree. But I think especially when, when we look now at what we are learning about Trump's attempts to really overturn the election, he put it differently. I think psychologically, he convinced himself that it had to be fraudulent because of course he convinced himself he was overwhelmingly popular and therefore had to win any fair election. So I think he actually, um, he talks about overturning the election. Sometimes I, I think he felt that was meaning validating the real. Will. But anyway, it was objectively overturning the results of the election and that he was much more serious about that than most of us, even the anti-Trump people realized at the time and that it came closer to succeeding than we realized and was stopped only by a handful of Republican leaders the uh, Rathenberger in uh, Georgia and Kemp, even the governor, and uh, the people, the Trump appointees in the second level of the Justice Department. Uh, so, you know, there was that is not only sort of what we see in some of Europe, on the other hand, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to chase today's headlines, but of course the Czech, the, the elections in the Czech Republic showed some movement in the opposite direction. Uh, so the point of that is just, um, I'm not sure we're gonna see a continued rise of authoritarians, I think, there's enough democracy in both the structure and opinion that in many countries, a drift toward authoritarianism may well be reversed, partly because the Winston Churchill quote 
that, you know, authoritarians, very hard to rule well. They close out alternative sources of information. Uh, they can't appoint fully competent people because it has to be loyalty more than competence. Uh, in some cases, authoritarians can, as we say, deliver the goods, but those are more limited conditions. So I'm not as pessimistic as some of my uh, some of my friends. I also think that it's relatively easy, relatively, for democracies to cooperate. Although some of the discussion of the democratic peace and other things, I think it goes a good deal too far. But I do think it's harder for autocracies. Yes, they want to support each other, but by their nature, they've the interests are narrower, more nationalistic, and harder for them to concert. So I'm, again, not as pessimistic on that score either. That said, I mean, if you'd have, you know, the, the world is much worse than I would have expected, say, 10 years ago in terms you know, of this. So we may yet have a new dividing line of the authoritarians and the democracies. Uh, if we do, I'm sure there'll be lots of pundits who will stress, as we did in the Cold War, the debilitating aspects of democracies, uh, how they can't follow a consistent, coherent policies, how they can't mobilize. But I think when we look at it more broadly, we find that democracies really can do better. And it's in Ken Waltz was one of his arguments. I mean, he mostly looked at the international system, but Ken always pushed back against conventional wisdom. And in the 1950s and into the 60s, the conventional wisdom was that democracies had a terrible time uh, competing democratic, democratic constitutions and arrangements were not built for foreign policy and international relations. They were always taken to the cleaners. They'd be outcompeted. Ken rejected that, and I think rightly so. Again, I cannot stop making connections with Themistocles. I mean, one of his strategic weapons was the use of democracy, the way that he mobilized the whole Athenian population and not only to become politically relevant, but also uh, strategically relevant, uh, uh, being able to, to fight for, for their country. Before that, it was only a minority of hoplites and uh, coming mostly for the mid-class or the rich farmers. And by uh, using democracy actually changed the balance of power. Uh, it, uh, as a matter of fact, it turned to be a weapon. Oh. Oh. Yanis, would you like to ask any question to Professor Jervis? Yes, thank you very much. I have two brief questions. The first one has to do with uh, one of the favorite uh, domains of uh, Professor Jervis, intelligence, the other is psychology. We know that uh, leaders need the uh, credible, accurate, and timeless intelligence in order to take decisions for war. On the other hand, as uh, Professor Jervis uh, has written in a preface, Intelligence can be a threat to democracy. So is it better to have uh, people like Snowden and organizations like WikiLeaks who reveal uh, states, governments wrongdoing, wrongdoings and state secrets or to establish a holistic intelligence oversight system? Yes, uh, real tension uh, and and Snowden epitomizes some of it. Is he a hero 
uh, uh, for revealing this, or is he a traitor? I think he's both. Uh, I mean, it's um, Obama, and I generally supported, I mean, not my, well, well of President Obama, but uh, when Snowden revealed stuff, there was some debate, not as much as I would have liked, on what is appropriate in terms of surveillance. And Obama talked about this was an important debate to have. Well, we wouldn't have had it were not for Snowden. Obama did not, would have been hard, but didn't orchestrate the debate. Didn't, he could have said, hey, we've got the various capabilities. I'm not gonna tell you exactly what we press on the keyboard, but let me tell you, and we need to think about how, what we should do and what we're not. He didn't do that. I don't blame him. It would have been a terrible headache. Uh, his political opponents would have trounced him for revealing secrets. But, um, and I know, well, I don't want to say no is, no is too strong, but I did a lot of work uh, for the intelligence community. I think had some trust of people at both the working levels and the high levels and had a number of conversations. And I think they were honest with me, although I never, never can be sure. And they did say that the Snowden, they said to me in private what they said in public, which is the Snowden uh, revelations had a number of, and WikiLeaks had a number of bad effects. They could see information drying up. They could see uh, allies not cooperating. They could, uh, in sharing intelligence, they could see a lot of things that made, that reduced the, their ability to keep the president and also our allies informed. I, I think that's correct. I, I can't prove it, it does rest on trust. Um, so there was a definite cost. On the other hand, I think the Patriot Act passed in great haste after 9-11. Uh, the associated expansion of the techniques of listening in that Snowden revealed um, are dangerous, that I'm proud to be a, a member of the American Civil Liberties Union and think that uh, it's very important to maintain free speech privacy, have the government not overreach. The balance is very hard to strike. Uh, and we're seeing a version of that in the question of how should uh, social media be regulated? And I think, I wish there had been a way to have that debate, to bring out more information without the indiscriminate links of Snowden and, uh, and WikiLeaks. In a better run world, there would have been a way. In the world we live in, probably not. Probably couldn't have done it uh, without Snowden. And uh, that means in terms of the quality of the intelligence, we lost a lot. Now, is that a price worth paying? My friends in the intelligence community would say no, it's too high a price. Uh, I have the luxury not of having to produce intelligence for the president uh, and just watching the debate. And I'd say it's an unfortunate price and I wish there were another way, but yes, it's a price worth paying. Wonderful. Well, let me, we're running out of time, but let me use the chair's imperative to ask two more questions and we will done with that. Uh, you have done an immense contribution on your book on nuclear revolution discussing about the effects on man. 
Could you try to update this discussion in light of uh, uh, big data, uh, algorithms, and uh, apply it to the current Sino-American competition, whether uh, the nuclear balance will still be stable in the near future. So those are my first question. And the second is a little more general in the direction of the field. When Peter Katzenstein visited us several years ago, he half jokingly said, if I was in the job market, probably I wouldn't have been hired because I don't do or game theory and um, a rational choice analysis. That's the direction of our field. Could you offer a kind of a criticism the way that our field uh, is going? Yes, uh, two very important questions. On nuclear revolution, <laughs> as you know, there have been, if you will, a counterattack led by friends of mine, Austin Long, a former colleague, and now in the Pentagon and still a very good friend, and Brendan Green, and, and uh, also Lieber and Press book. And there's a symposium in the Texas National Security Review in which uh, several people, which was the 40th anniversary of, of the nuclear revolution. What do you think, I think? And people comment because then I had my reply. And so I'll be to summarize, yeah, technology um, was very tricky even during the Cold War. And I think the military never accepted the nuclear revolution and some civilian leaders kept looking for ways out. But I think they realized in the end, there was no way out. Even Nixon, the famous case who wanted the way, realized in the end that uh, in the famous uh, statement endorsed by Reagan and Gorbachev, the Geneva summit, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And that is a revolutionary change. And I think the search for tech revolution, or to me, technological ways out very interesting and I can understand it, but never worked. I think that's true today. Uh, now the Chinese nuclear force is of course much smaller than the Soviet. It's now growing in ways that some people feel menacing. I don't, I think they're searching for a suit. Make sure that the second strike is secure in light of the developments you said, uh, greatly increased uh, sensor capability, greater accuracy, use of big data to be able to uh, foil the other side, cyber measures in which we could perhaps disable the Chinese command and control system without and then destroy at some leisure the military forces, but essentially uh, disable them first through cyber. If I were a Chinese leader, uh, I'd be very worried and I'd want to get more land-based missiles, more mobile, out to sea in various ways. So um, I'm not alarmed. I would hope the US and China could regulate this the way eventually the US and the Soviet Union were able to do starting with the SALT agreement. Uh, but even without that, I think it is really more, more stable. Do I worry? Yes. I mean, you know, we can think of the ways in which the Sino-American war would start. But I think at bottom, we have to remember in the past, wars started often because someone thought they could really win an all out war, right? The Persians with good reason thought they could conquer. No one even thinks they can win an all out war. Gotta hope to keep it limited. That's a much harder task. So I think the world is safe. 
On the IR field, I have, as usual, mixed feelings um, that I think Peter Katzenstein was a little too gloomy that it had, we've, the IR field has innovated a great deal, thanks in part to people like Peter, who was a pioneer in social constructivism and who you know, he and his students have had enormous impact here and in Europe. And of course, some of the European constructivism has European union roots. I'm not saying that it just followed the American, not at all. But uh, so there is good variety and uh, you can pick up a journal like International Security. It's largely realist, not entirely. It's just reading the issue before last. And uh, it's stressing you know, ideas more than material factors. So you see, uh, uh, you know, say a variety there. You see a, a good deal of attention to domestic sources, some to leadership, um, qualitative as well as quantitative. I think there is still the problem that quantitative techniques are both statistical, uh, game theory, and experimental are privileged but not entirely so. And I just want to make two comments. One, um, you know, I'm a great believer in Tom Schelling's game theory. As a friend of Tom's and treasure with a picture that a colleague had from my test trip that Tom came up 10 years ago and at the conference and a picture of us together. I can't think of anyone I've mattered more to me personally and professionally. Tom told me that I got the Nobel Prize for game theory. I'm not a game theorist. And he's right. I mean, what he does did was a particular form that used aspects of strategic interaction. That is situation with two actors or more. Each one is acting, anticipating what others are do, are likely to do, knowing that others are anticipating what they're likely to do, knowing all that. So it's game theory in that sense, but not in a lot of the more formal sense, much more psychological, much more empirical, much more grounded. And I think, uh, I don't think Peter would reject that. I think, um, you know, so that game theory in some sense is not as antithetical to a more for humanistic approach. But yes, the field is terribly faddish. It drives me nuts that the latest fad is experiments. Now, again, about a dozen years ago, a student of mine, a good friend, Rose McDermott, leading political psychologist, um, she had an article using experimental methods because she was trained partly as psychologist, and they do. And she submitted it to a couple of, you know, to a journal whose desk rejected, that is, the editor rejected it, didn't send it out for reviews. And he said, political scientists and certainly IR scholars don't do experiments. Well, once economists, you know, once Danny Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics. By the way, the story of that, I got friends with Kahneman and Tversky, that they wrote up their piece on prospect theory, very important. And Amos started as a mathematical psychologist. And he said, hey, let me write an appendix, a mathematical appendix. It's not needed for the article. But if we do that, it can get in a very high visibility economics journal. Economists will read it because it's got a really solid mathematical appendix. So Danny said, sure, why not? And the rest, so to speak, is history. 
Anyway, once uh, Danny won the Nobel Prize, Amos, alas, died by that time and so was ineligible. He would have obviously won it. Uh, that once economists doing, start doing experiments, political scientists said, oh, experiments. Well, yes, both natural experiments, field experiments, and, uh, and lab or, or like many of them can be valuable. You know, I, I think they were in addition, but the sense that now this is the best, if not the only way to go, you know, it's just, let's just not go overboard on this. And finally, I'm ready to go on, but I've just read a forthcoming article by Michael Toms and Jessica Weeks on public opinion, on uh, living up to or reneging on alliance commitments and variables that affect that, like is the alliance with another democracy? Is it a formal or informal, uh, the level of danger, all sorts. Of, and they do very good work and come out with various results. So in a way, it's a model article. It also, and I say, I think well of them, uh, in a way it shows the blinker, the nature of a lot of political science research that, you know, they used, I forgot whether it was Mechanical Turk or Yugo, but you know, they did the standard thing uh, of to get a good sample. All that's right and I have no problem. But when we think about what I hate, the real world, think about, again, American public opinion on living up to or reneging on a commitment. What will be absolutely crucial is the partisan politics. Who is president? I'm willing to say that whatever happens and the withdrawal from Afghanistan is a great example that the supporters of the president, those of his party will overwhelmingly, not 100%, but overwhelmingly support the policy. The opposition party will overwhelmingly reject it. The, they will say, oh, this is an enormous hit to our reputation. Uh, this reneging on a commitment is immoral. You've sold all that. The point is that the survey experiments uh, are denatured. They've taken the politics out of this. And that was never right. And in, a, in America, public opinion now, I mean, it's a great psychological experiment. If you take people and focus them on this, you can say something about how they're thinking in that way, and that can be very interesting. Does it tell you how pu the public would react uh, to a real situation? No. So there is, a you hear the exasperation in my tone, the, uh, um, an inability to deal with the basic tension. They said at the beginning, it's a collective enterprise. We work with others. We take off from their work, we criticize them, we build on it. Yes, you should pay attention. The tension between that and sort of working in the field with what is what is considered best and stepping back and saying, does this really make any sense at all? That's hard. And I think, you know, one tends to get trapped into, uh, okay, what's hot in the journals now? And how do I do one slight uh, building on it? Well, Professor Tervis, thank you very, very much for your historic speech and your enlightening discussion. <laughs> oh, we're really privileged to have you with us. Uh, with Professor Aritzia Biris, we are looking forward to travel to the lift of travel restrictions so we can travel to New York and offer you in person the uh, Themistocles Award instead of sending it to you by DHL and to, to continue uh, our discussion. Uh, and also, and most importantly, 
I hope that next year the conditions will permit that you will visit us in Piraeus, the city that Themistocles used okay. as the springboard for the Athenian Empire, uh, and visit the Themistocles Wall and the place that um, the Athenian ship were built and maintained, uh, so to, to, to see the whole place in action and have you, most importantly, talk to our students that read your book and they would love to meet you in person. Once again, thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you. And I do hope uh, that both COVID and my health permit, I would very much love to visit. Thank you. Thank you. Good night to all of you. Yes.